Good morning, this is Kim, and I wanted to spend some time recording the answers to the practice quiz that I put out there. You will have a tax quiz that will open this Sunday, so I'm going to go over this quiz. I put another one out there in the weekly folder for Monday homework, and I will do a video of the answers to that quiz as well before you take your quiz next week. All right, so let's get started. This is the quiz that was out there. And if I were taking this quiz and I were you, I would have an Excel file open for a calculator or have a calculator at my disposal. First question, what is the average tax rate on taxable income of 48,000 divided by 2,435? Well, we know the formula for average tax rate equals tax due divided by taxable income. So in this case it's going to be 2435 divided by 48,000 and if I put this over here on my calculator move a cord here, hold on and change that to a percent which means I need to move the decimal over two places the answer is going to be 5%. Next question. Four advantages of cash equivalents. Remember, cash equivalents are at the bottom of that pyramid, and the advantages of cash equi equivalents are the following. Emergency fund. Most important. We need a fund that we can go to instead of having to use a credit card or borrow money from someone else. Everybody should have an emergency fund. Next, safe. Remember, cash equivalents are invested in interest-bearing accounts that are what's called FDIC insured, which means the government has insured them up to $250,000 per account. So that would be the second one. The next is that they're liquid. Liquid would imply that we can get to the money easily with the exception of CDs. Since CDs are tied up for a year they're not uh, as liquid as some of the other ones like money market accounts or savings or T-bills or anything like that. Okay that's only three. What would be a fourth advantage? I can tell you a disadvantage is they don't make much money but a fourth advantage would be that it provides us with some peace of mind. Okay we just have some money in the bank which is a good thing it is our foundation uh, and what I mean by this is that once we have some cash we can we can now start moving up the pyramid into stocks for example but we need that foundation forced. So all of these are good reasons for cash equivalents. Number four, you could probably think of some others, but uh, that's five so far. Should Sarah take a tuition deduction of $2,500 or a credit of $1,000 if she is in the 20% tax bracket? Well, this is an interesting question. You had one of these similar on your homework. So here's how I would think about it. When you have the word deduction, this is uh, subtracted before uh, we calculate tax due. Or in other words, it's above the line. So a deduction is only as powerful as your tax rate. So we would take here, for example, $2,500 and we'd multiply it times 20%, 0.2, which is going to give us that the value of that is, is actually equal to a $500 reduction in taxes. Because the, the deduction the reduction is only as powerful as 20% of the deduction amount. Now, on the other hand, a credit is uh, 
fully, let me change this here, it reduces your taxes dollar for dollar. Okay? So if the credit is worth a thousand dollars, as it says up here in the problem, then this amounts to a one thousand dollar reduction in taxes. And, and remember, our goal is to reduce our tax liability to the federal government here. So do we want to take a deduction of $500 or a credit of $1,000? Remember, cr credits are subtracted directly from tax due. Well, I think here that we want to take the $1,000 credit because we save more money. in taxes due. Next question, how does tax avoidance differ from tax evasion? Pretty easy question here. Evasion is illegal <laughs> and avoidance is legal. Okay, problem. <laughs> Go to the question. What amount would Sarah report as taxable income? Oh, okay. Well, I know that taxable income uh, does not include any credits because credits are only subtracted after I calculate tax due. So I see an energy credit right here, and now I know that this is not uh, applicable. Okay, because I'm only I'm stopping at taxable income. So I'm going to go over here to my spreadsheet and I'm going to start looking for income categories. So income here I have fifty thousand gross income. I also have tips of eleven thousand. Uh, IRA deduction, no. Itemized, no. Tuition adjustment, no. Social Security earnings, yep, they're taxable. $3,000. And that's it. So my total income is this amount. And I know you can do this in your head, but who wants to make a mistake? All right, after I do income, now I'm going to look for adjustments. And I do see some adjustments here, and I know that these are going to be subtracted. So my adjustments include uh, an, an IRA deduction of $2,000. So now I've used that. Uh, I have another adjustment of tuition of $400. That's an adjustment and I don't see anything else. So my total adjustments, I'm just going to copy this, total adjustments are $2,400 and if I take income and I subtract adjustments that's going to give me $61,600 and this is of course AGI, Adjusted Gross Income in that very important number. Now from here I know that I have a choice. I can either take itemized deductions or the standard deduction. And I didn't put the standard deduction on here because I need you to memorize it. But so I know from the posted information that the standard deduction for this year is $6,300. So if I look here, the itemized deductions are higher than the standard deduction. So I'm going to go ahead and subtract off itemized deductions, which is $6,300. And personal exemption, one personal exemption, I'll put PE here. And again, I told you you need to memorize this, and the personal exemption amount for this year is $4,050. So these numbers, go ahead and put them in red because we're going to subtract them. This was also in red. If I take 
my AGI and I subtract 6300 and I also subtract 4050 there is my taxable income 51,250 so I'm going to go ahead and put on here this is 51,250 now when you do your quiz I'm going to ask you to show me the math so I'm going to need to just see some numbers on here if you want to add them up in your head whatever but you need to write them out okay moving on number six the question asks you to identify whether or not this would be on the balance sheet B or C for cash flow and I went over these earlier remember balance sheet are those big balances we have or or major assets that we own so in this case our home personal residence well that's going to be a big balance sheet item so I'm going to put, put a B on the other hand gym membership payment anything that's a monthly payment is going to go on our flat cash flow just subtract from our monthly uh, income and expenses again credit card payment this is a payment not the big balance so that's going to be on our cash flow student loan disbursement this is monthly income that re that we receive so again going to be on our cash flow internet service cash flow balance mortgage balance when we see the word balance immediate trigger that it's going to go on our balance sheet buying a Starbucks cash flow parking pass cash flow commission check again this is just a monthly income check or maybe quarterly but it still goes on our cash flow and a new outfit cash flow how much tax would you pay on taxable income of forty five thousand dollars oh boy she would have to ask me one of those questions so here's what I'm gonna do I'm gonna pop into the website and I know I have this Forbes I did have it cancel that for a second I'm gonna copy this because I need my tax brackets Okay, maybe not. I'll go ahead and type in here tax brackets 2016. I remember I like to use the Forbes because they have those those uh, formulas attached. And here's the website. I hope you had looked at this already from last week's homework. And again, unless I tell you otherwise, we're going to assume that everybody in this class is single. Everybody is single. So I'm going to go right here to the tax brackets. And here's the tax table I'm going to use. I'm going to expand this a little bit. So I'm looking for, I'm going back to my quiz here, and it says $45,000. So $45,000 is right here on this row. So this is going to be my formula. I'm just going to cheat here, and I'm going to go ahead and put this. in my table so that's the tax table I need so now I'm just going to follow the formula I'm going to take forty five thousand dollars because we start at the end and I'm going to subtract going from the back thirty seven six fifty and then I'm going to take that amount 
and I'm going to multiply it times 0.15. Now, I just want you to remember, don't make a mistake, I'm going to put this in brackets. I'm actually going to do this over here. So I'm going to take equals $45,000 and I'm going to subtract 37650. That gives me 7350. The next thing I'm going to do with this is I'm going to then multiply it by 0.25. As that's what it says. Take the amount, subtract this, multiply it by 0.25. So now I'm going to take this amount, multiply it by 0.25, gives me 1837. And lastly, I'm going to add, I'm going to 1837.50, and then I'm going to simply add this first number, 5183.75. So, this equals here 1837.50. I'm going to add 5183.75. And there's my answer, which equals 7,031.25. cents. That's my text due. And again, make sure you show the formulas on the quiz. Okay. Next question, describe four types of cash equivalents. And when I say describe, if you just list them, you don't get credit for it. So I'm going to first describe a uh, money market account, for example. And what is it? It's a bank product that provides interest with some restrictions in monthly withdrawals. And, and minimum balances. Knowing that a money market account is more restrictive than a savings account in that you can only take money out, out six times a month. Next I might describe a CD and that is a uh, money we uh, commit for uh, a certain period of time in return for interest. Remember in a CD you commit to whatever time period you buy so it could be a three month CD, six month CD, one year, five year, etc. But once you put that money in it's locked up for that period of time. So if interest rates were to go up you'd be stuck at that low interest rate for your CD because during the period it's invested the interest rate does not change. Which is why now, if you think about it, in a low interest environment, do we really want to tie up our money in a long-term CD? I don't think so, because the only direction interest rates can go is up. And uh, we would miss out on interest rate increases. Question 9. This is probably going to be uh, the most difficult math question. It's really not mathy, but let's give it a whirl. What are taxes due? I'm going to go over here, open this up, and the first thing I'm going to look for is salary. Again, I'm going to type in my categories, income, adjustments, next. So my income here is 85,000 and tips of 5,000. Do I have any, and right now I'm looking for adjustments. I do. I have that IRA deduction of $5,000. Okay. I don't see any other adjustments. So next I have AGI, which I know is total income. subtract total adjustments. So this is going to equal the 90,000 subtract 5,000. Next I'm looking for from AGI, do I take the standard deduction or the itemized deductions? Well, look here. Standard deduction is $6,300 
and itemized deductions are $10,000. So I'm going to take itemized deductions because they're significantly higher. So I'm going to put over here ID, itemized deductions, and I know that's 10000 And personal exemption, use the current. Remember, for everybody, you're single, so that's 4050. And that's the PE or the personal exemption. And I'm going to subtract both of these from AGI. So this is going to equal 85,000. Subtract 10,000. Subtract 4,050. What does this equal right here? I think we all know this is TI or taxable income. Now, once I have taxable income, I have to go right here and calculate tax due. In this particular problem and on the one for your test, it doesn't matter what, I mean, obviously the tax due is going to be higher than 15%, but I'm going to give you the tax rate. You're going to use the rate I give you. So you're just going to take taxable income and you're going to multiply it times the tax rate that I gave you in the problem. So in this case, it's 15%. So you're going to take this number, taxable income, and you're going to multiply it times 0.15, changing that percent to a decimal. There is your tax due, 10,642. And then the last thing that we do is subtract all the credits. Do we have credits? Yes, we have $500. We have another education credit of $2,000. And an earned income credit of $400. So our total credits are $2,400. So last thing we're going to do is calculate final tax due which is going to be this tax due, subtract all the credits, 82.42. But guess what? We've already paid taxes withheld throughout the year, $2,200. So let's subtract another $2,200 because we've already sent that money. Our employer has already sent that money to the federal government. So now we're going to take the 8242 and we're going to subtract off 2200 and the answer is $6,042. So I'm going to go over here, $6,042. I don't care about the cents. I don't ever care about the cents. So you can round all these problems if you want. Okay, next, why is AGI important? I can't remember in a previous video I had you look this up, but it is important because this number determines eligibility for deductions and credits. In other words, if your AGI, your adjusted gross income is too high, then you will not qualify for any tax credits. It's not for the rich. Similarly, if your AGI is too high, you won't qualify for any deductions. So this would mean, uh, you know, not qualified for an IRA deduction. Government is saying to the rich, if you make too much money, you don't, you're not able to take these deductions or credits. Now it's funny because I always ask my classes, would you rather have an AGI that is so high that you don't qualify for any credits or deductions or would you rather have an AGI that's lower that allows you to qualify for deductions and credits? And, and it's really a thinking question because a lot of students uh, say, well I want a low J AGI so I qualify for credits. But if you think about it, would you rather be make so much money or have a, such a high AGI that you don't? I want you to think about that. Okay, two reasons why studying taxes is important. Uh, first reason, we want to minimize our tax liability. Of course, second reason is uh, we want to plan our tax 
not play, plan our tax strategy. So in my life, I'm always thinking about what can I do next year to reduce my taxable income? Should I put solar on my house for a credit, for example? Should I uh, buy a rental property and use the additional mortgage write-off? Um, all kinds of things that I think about for planning for taxes for not only myself but also for my clients. 12. Find a rate of a CD online. List the bank rate fees and any minimum deposit. This is where you would go back to bankrate.com. So I'll do it real quickly. I'm going to go here to bankrate. And I'm looking for, I'm going to go over here, uh, CD rate. One year CD, that's what I'm looking for. And here are some that pop up. So you could pick pick one. Synchrony Bank has a 1.25 one year CD rate, a minimum deposit of $2,000, for example. I want you to be able to look these up because remember bank rate is a national sweep of all different kinds of rates. And uh, you want to be able to check, you know, what's your bank showing and what can you get from a virtual bank. It's important that you know what, what your choices are. Choices are a great thing. All right, so you can either copy and paste this or you can write down the information. I'm not going to do that right now. Instead, I'm going to assume that you know how to do that. So you're going to list the bank, synchrony, the rate, 1.25, fees, if any. It doesn't show any fees on here. And the minimum deposit, which would have been $2,000. How does a money market account different from a standard savings? Again, it is more restrictive in terms of withdrawals and minimum balance. How much money will you make annually on $1,000 deposited in a savings account paying 0.05% and I do not want you to miss this and I, I'm I'm really hoping you pay attention because there will be another question like this. If I go ahead and I look at my Excel calculator here, the biggest problem with, with this is remembering how to convert a percent to a decimal. And when you do that, you just move this decimal point to the left two spaces. So this number would actually be 0 .0005 and the amount is $1,000. So if I take that number and I multiply it times a thousand dollars, look what I get. Fifty cents. That's it. Fifty cents. If your bank is paying point zero one, that's ten cents. Again, ten cents. That's an annual amount. That's nothing. You can find that money in your couch or somewhere buried in your car. What is a major disadvantage of keeping money in a jar? Well, if we keep money in a jar, we're not earning any interest at all. So the major disadvantage is earning nothing in terms of interest. But also, what is eating away at our money? That's right, inflation is eating away at our money. If prices are going up 1% each year and you're not investing your money at 1% each year, then you are losing money. You know, I think about that now when I was growing up, my mom wouldn't even cash her paychecks. She would just keep them in a cabinet, whole stack of paychecks. And then when they wanted to buy something, they would go cash them all and, and pay for something. And anytime she got cash, she kept it in a recipe book. So again, not very smart practice, but she didn't take a personal finance class. Last question, an extra two points. Why should an individual file a tax return 
if they only made two thousand dollars and they won't owe any taxes why should they file a tax return I want you to think about that I'm not going to answer it because it's extra credit okay so this is long and I'm uh, I'm going to sign off on on this video and post it so thanks for listening